Okay, now can you see my PowerPoint okay? Yes, everything is fine. And, and you can Thank see you. me still? Okay. Well, uh, in my presentation, uh, I want to give, uh, I'm going to be drawing upon some results of research that we've done, myself and my team have done in Australia, but also in Canada, in the Canadian provinces of, of Ontario and Quebec. And, and I'm going to draw upon those results to look at this question of um, how are climate change and forest management influencing wildfire. So this is uh, my, my main point, I guess, is that we're now beginning to get evidence that how we're managing our forests, particularly uh, forests, naturally regenerating forests that are managed for commodity production, that we're starting to see some interactions with our rapidly changing climate. And that extraordinary photo is from um, uh, Australia's 2019-2020, what we call our Black Summer Mega 5, which I'm going to be, be re referring to shortly. So uh, I'm going to talk about the climate impact drivers of wildfire, how climate change has and is going to influence wildfire, and some of the evidence that we're starting to see some, some effects of forest management in at least some aspects of wildfire regimes. So you might, uh, some of you might remember back in the year 2020, uh, Australia had a lot of international coverage because we had this mega fire in, in the southeast of the country, which is where most of our population is. And it burned, uh, it burned between 5.8 to 8.1 million hectares. Um, there's, there's that range because uh, the 5.8 is forest land that burnt, and there was another 3 million hectares of non-forest land that burnt. Had a massive impact. There was 114 listed threatened species, lost at least half their habitat, and 49 lost over 80%. 3,000 houses were destroyed. 33 people directly killed. And there was a further 400 deaths and 3,000 hospitalizations due to cardiovascular or respiratory conditions. It was like a $2 billion health bill. And, and the fires burnt for basically five months from the north to the south, and they encased uh, two of our major capital cities, Brisbane uh, and, and Sydney, as well as some of the regional centres, the Gold Coast and Newcastle and others. They encased them in, in smoke, in, in wildfire smoke, for months. It was an extraordinary sight. There was billions of dollars in insured losses and billions of dollars lost in different sectors, tourism, hospitality, agriculture, and forestry. So it, it was un, it was absolutely un, unprecedented. So how do we explain that? How do we explain such a, a massive fire in our in our uh, forested land? Well, of course, this is because wildfire risk is really driven by fire weather. Uh, Internationally, there's a fire weather index. Um, there's a version of it we use in Australia called the Forest Fire Danger Index, some of you may be familiar with. It's based upon daily values for, for temperature, relative humidity and wind speed, but also a drought factor for the preceding period, for the, prece for, for the preceding period, which I'll talk about shortly. So, so we know that fire weather drives the chances of a fire weather, weather starting of a fire starting, it, it drives the fire behavior and uh, critically it um, drives the difficulty of fire suppression. And that's a, and that's a shot of another shot of the great, uh, of our black summer fire burning over Ridge, um, actually quite close to the our capital city, Canberra. And uh, the, the, interestingly, the forest fire di uh, uh, danger index was, was first calibrated in Australia in the 1970s, and it went from zero to 100. Um, but increasingly, because of climate change, we're starting to get forest fire danger index values above 100. Uh, in fact, during the, as I'll talk about shortly, during the, our Black Summer fire, there were values up to 160. Um, so they had to invent a new or create a new fire danger risk category. We went from none to low, moderate, severe, to, to catastrophic because of this fire. 
Um, and, and what we've learned uh, is that under, under these dangerous fire weather conditions, these, these extreme and catastrophic fire weather conditions, uh, that it's fuel dryness rather than fuel load, which is, which is the key factor. And that, it, and that it's the dryness of living, uh, living and dead biomass, which is a key constraint on the occurrence of large bushfires in the region. We, we call wildfires bush, bushfires in Australia, but they're, they're just wildfires there. We call our forest fires wildfires. Any kind of unplanned fires are, we call a bushfire, but it's what internationally is referred to as wildfires. Uh, and, and those data there is from a study by Nolan and others which show the um, um, uh, dead fuel moisture content, the kind of historic range in grey, and, and what the values were during our black summer. Dur during, actually, during the, the uh, winter and, and spring um, of 2019, and you can see that they were right at, right at the bottom of the range. So we had, because uh, our winter is in the middle of the year, being in the Southern Hemisphere, so we we had you know, just about the driest um, winter on record. So what that meant was in in spring, which starts in September, uh, and our summer, which begins in December, our 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 fuel our biomass moisture content was at at record lows. So it it was it was highly uh, flammable. And that those graphs are for dead fuel moisture content. There was also a remotely sent study done on living living mo uh, biomass content, which is the the canopy foliage, and that that showed a similar response. So the link, therefore, between there's this link between drought and, and fire, and, and and it's the dryness of the fuel, which is not just the dead biomass; it's also the living biomass. So. As I've been saying, those fires we had in spring and summer in eastern and southern Australia were unprecedented in terms of their geographic location, their spatial extent, their severity, and, and the forest types burnt. We had some, uh, the fire was so intense that it is severe that it even burnt into um, some rainforest. And they were driven by extreme fire weather conditions, which, and there were two main factors the winter drought I've just spoken of and extreme high spring and summer temperatures. Uh, so the drought then uh, is, is linked to fire risk through fuel, fuel dryness. It results in low fuel moisture content. It triggers leaf senescence and shedding in eucalypt trees and increases surface fine fuels. It also results in normally damp gullies and rainforest patches being unable to impede fire spread across the landscape. That photo there, is actually from um, uh, a town on the south coast of New South Wales. The um, it was a small fishing and tourist town, coastal town. Uh, but the fire sw swept through the forest, uh, through the town, and uh, the town's population, including all the tourists, um, had to take refuge on the beach, where the Australian Navy was sent in to rescue them. And again, this was quite. Um, and that shows you the kind of smoke haze that was encasing uh, not just this landscape, but our major cities as well. So how has observed climate change impacted wildfire? Um, so that just shows you the long-term change in Australia, Australia's, uh, it's the equivalent of the of, of increasing global when we talk about degrees global warming, it's the it's the uh, global average daily surface temperature for a year compared to what it was around 1850. Well, this is that same kind of metric for Australia. The average the average annual daily surface temperature for Australia compared to in this case what it was in 1910, and you can see we've had nearly 1.5 degrees of global warming. Well, that increase in the in, in, in warming, that trend, that rising trend, has driven an increase in the severity and, uh, and frequency and duration and extent of all extreme weather events. And in particular, uh, I, I mentioned about winter rainfall, and that's what the top graph shows. That just shows you uh, uh, during, during 2019, 
the uh, which is during the winter period between April to October, the winter spring period, uh, or, or actually the autumn to spring period, it was extremely low over southern and eastern Australia. And that trend is um, is is continuing. We're seeing a ongoing since since about the 1970s, there's been a there's been about a 20% drop in in winter rainfall on average across southern and eastern Australia. And that trend is continuing with every increment of global warming. At the bottom, you can see the increase in the number of days Australian mean temperatures were in the warmest 1% of records. So you can see the, the frequency of extreme heat events is increasing. And actually, the, the, the actual temperature of extreme events is increasing as well. So when you put those two together, the declining drought and the increasing heat of extreme heat events, especially in spring and summer, and you plug them into the forest fire danger index I spoke about before, the map in the middle shows this change in the number of dangerous fire weather days, i.e. the number of days when the fire weather conditions are extreme to catastrophic. If there's a fire, it will be extreme to cat catastrophic. It'll have an FFDI over 100. And uh, that shows you, uh, you can, uh, that shows you everywhere in Australia that experienced a wildfire in the summer of 2019 and 2020. The, the what we call our, our black summer mega fires were in the southeast portion, portion here, but there was an extraordinary number of fires um, through, throughout the continent. So climate change is definitely uh, escalating wildfires. It's also escalating, um, it's, it's escalating their frequency and duration and extent, but also their severity. And that means their impacts are getting, are getting worse. Um, and those weather conditions have increased and will continue to increase in many regions of the world. However, there are also regions of the world where the fire weather is not getting worse. It's actually um, decreasing. And that's because at a global scale, a warmer world is a wetter world. The atmosphere can hold more water and, and uh, what goes up must come down. So there are parts of the world uh, um, uh, in different regions of the world uh, where it's not getting uh, drier and the fire risk is going up. Uh, it's actually getting wetter. The there's a big difference in West Africa and East Africa, um, for example, West, Central, West and East Central Africa for, for um as an example. But, but overall, many, many regions of the world are seeing this increase in the frequency and duration and extent of dangerous fire. But also the, the severity. Uh, and, uh, and as the severity increases, so do, the, so do the impacts, which is what's illustrated on the back. That was from an IPCC sixth assessment report. And that's actually looking, uh, that was some analysis that was done about Australia's mega fires where it's just showing you the cascading impacts um, from, from this mega wildfire in terms of the impact it had on health and emergency services and livestock and wildlife, water, water quality, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there are even, uh, even impacts all the way across in, in New Zealand from the smoke. And indeed, we're getting increasing evidence um, from all regions of, the, regions of the world about escalating fire weather danger. There's a paper from India, um, top right one from Europe. These are all quite recent papers, last year or this year. Uh, Chile and, and, and another one uh, in, a, in Australia. I want to talk now about the other component uh, is 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 forest management or how is forest managing also impacting on on fire regimes or wildfire fire regimes and I'm just going to show you some results from a paper it's currently in review um, papers called climate change and forest management interactions evident in Quebec mega fire burn severity so as I said we can talk about fire regimes in terms of their frequency duration intensity and extent uh, one of the characteristics or one of the um, variables we could look at in intensity is called burn severity, and it's proving to be have a high information content, particularly with respect to causal factors. 
But burnt severity generally refers to how much of the living and dead biomass at a, at a location was combusted by a fire. There's various models of this. One that we use is called the Composite Burn Index and integrate models of both fire severity, but also ecosystem response and provides a comprehensive assessment of the overall severity of the burn. Now, the fires that occurred in Quebec in 2023 attracted a lot of international attention. They were very large. They burnt 5 million hectares of boreal forests and the smoke plumes drifted over Chicago and, and New York City. And that map there shows you a map of the footprint of the fires, of, of these mega fires, and also the model burn severity. Um, it's, it's modeled from Sentinel Remote Sense Data, multi-span data. Uh, and there was a lot of fire that burned at, at, a, at a moderate to, to high intensity. So one of the, and there's a little location map in the bottom left corner to show you where those fires are in relation to Quebec and um, uh, to the province of Quebec in Canada. So uh, what we did was we did some spatial correlation analysis using a method called boosted regression trees, where we looked at if there were any environmental or and, and other factors um, that were spatially correlated with the severity, with the burn severity, i.e. were there were, were the locations that had a high burn severity, were they characterized by any by any particular factors and versus areas that had had low severity? Um, if you like, uh, uh, the alternative approach, the counterfactual to that is that it's just random, that the burn severity isn't isn't caused by any uh, factors. It's just um, it's just a random distribution. Well, well, this is what we found. Um, uh, so on the left-hand side are the explanatory variables, and uh, and and then in that tape that table on the left-hand side, and the numbers show the relative influence of those factors to to burn severity, and interestingly, uh, but not surprisingly, the the top two ones were the topographic wetness index and and the fire weather index. Um, topographic wetness index makes sense because areas that are lower in the landscape receiving their run on areas, they're collecting water, they're wet. The, the living and dead biomass will have higher moisture content and, and burn at a lower severity. Similarly, uh, and not unexpectedly, those locations that had very high fire weather index, extreme catastrophic fire weather conditions, high temperatures, strong winds, um, were also very relatively important. The third one though, uh, uh, topographic, well, the third, fourth, and fifth were were not so important, but they were still significant. The age of the forest stand or, or patch, but the forest age, and the topographic position index, and also the forest type. Now, how can we interpret this in, in terms of forest management? Well, uh, the way boreal forests are managed in, in, in Quebec is it's... it's uh, it's, it's large scale uh, clear fell cutting and the sites burned afterwards. So, so the, the, the long-term effect of doing that in the landscape is that the forest age is reduced. You're, you're, you, you, you tend to get stands that are, um, rather than being uh, old growth stands that are 100 years plus, they tend to be younger, uh, much younger, and often between 20 to 40. So what the modeling shows is that uh, is that the the you 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 a, lo a location was more likely to have high severity burns if it was a younger forest, and it was more likely to have low severity burns if it was an older forest, all factors equal. And similarly, there were certain topographic positions uh, which are favoured by by um, by commercial logging. And also, uh, the there's a lot of assisted regeneration after they log, and they tend to be uh, promoting species types which are more flammable than what the naturally regenerating forest is. So, uh, the the dominant influences were the topographic wetness index and, and and fire weather, but there was clearly a signal 
albeit a secondary one, of the impacts of forest management. And, and this shows, uh, this, this kind of explains uh, again how, why that is more significant than what it might sound. This is data from a paper we published um, beginning of this year in land. Uh, it, it was looking at the accumulated impacts of logging and other disturbances in the, in, in the uh, provinces of both Ontario and Quebec in, in Canada. And that's what's shown on the left-hand side. So you can see there's been a, a massive amount of logging over the last 50 years. Okay, so this, this is based upon provincial records, which, um, which uh, 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 enabled us to look at the accumulated impact of logging. So there's been a dramatic change in the age structure and composition of the forest. We have, we have a much younger forest and it's relatively more fire prone. And those graphs on the right, um, so I'm running out of time, I see, uh, I show you uh, area burned and area logged over time for, um, for the provinces. The green one's interesting. It's the, the green one in the middle graph. It's the fire weather index, which is like the forest fire danger index. And you can see, and, and, and it's a time series that goes from 78 to 2020. Uh, and this is for Quebec. And you can see that the forest fire, uh, the forest weather index is getting increasingly volatile and, and we're getting much more extreme weather conditions, which we know is another climate change signal. So to conclude, we really need to consider and take into account accumulated impacts over space and time of forest management. Um, we know we've got another 0.5 degrees more global warming locked in, which is actually as much as what we've seen in the last 20 years. So, so dangerous fire weather therefore is on the increase and we need to be um, factoring that into our, to our thinking and planning and management um, actions. Thank you.